for it. I'm up for it. I'm up for it. I'm up for it. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. So good to see you. Don't you notice how brightly lit this motherfucker is tonight? And all the cameras roving around, that means you're going to be immortalized on DVD, video, and whatever other media they squeeze it onto these days. Okay, so, I've never done a summer Astoria thing before. Usually, the Astoria in me, it's a cold winter experience, and this venue is always really cold on the inside, but the people make it warm. But now I have a nice warm summer day outside, so the place is suitably warm on the inside, and the whole vibe is different. England in summer with, with sunshine is just this amazing thing. And I, you must dig it, because I know how much of the year you guys just get this shit end of the weather stick. Because if you ever go to parts of Europe, like you look at your window in a hotel in, in, in like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, clouds are in the sky, but clouds are on the move. Clouds are leaving their country, and they're like, where are we going? I have to follow me. What's that gray green rock in the middle of the spitting brown green Atlantic Ocean? Oh, that's called England. All right, lads, slowly, not all at once, pace it. Well, why don't we all just like shower at once and then give them some sunshine? Oh, no, 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 then then rave music will go away. Then uh, the public will go out of business because everyone will want to be outside and be doing more stuff than drinking themselves into a stupor or taking shitty drugs and listening to jack-off music. So we're just going to pace it out. <laughs> Otherwise, the guy in the cure won't have a job. <laughs> and so you wait for the big rain to come. Like, come on, give it to me. And someone will say, like, oh, what's the weather like? Oh, it's pissing down rain. You go outside and it's like, beep, 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 beep. And if you go to the tropics, you get like four inches of rain in like 30 seconds. It's like amazing, like three, four, <laughs> sun's out, yay! And everyone goes around and and plays again. But here, it's just like every day. Uh, and it's like an old man standing over your neck. <clears throat> so I've been on this tour for like three or four months and I'm dinged in the head, can't you tell? And I spent about six weeks hopping, bopping and popping across America and I spent a little while in Canada, a place that no one really hears about. And it's not that Canada isn't cool, Canada is amazing. And if you've ever been to Canada, you should go because it's a, it's a wonderful part of the world where they have not polluted their skies, they've not polluted their water. You can actually look at bodies of water and see the bottom and they have living things inside the water. Nothing like where I come from. And they're very jealous of their borders. They're always guarding their borders very carefully. When you try and come in, they search you for everything. They search your mind, they search your body, they search your soul. <laughs> You're coming into our country, eh? Yeah. Why? <laughs> well, I'm gonna do a show. Okay, you, you don't have any guns, do you? Because guns are bad, you know. We don't like guns, guns are bad. You people are shooting each other in your own high schools. Guns are bad. You sure you don't have any guns? Yeah, I'm sure. Can we reach up your ass and look for guns? <laughs> like, you know, go ahead. And like, uh, they're not finding any guns. They pull a Starbucks out of my ass. <laughs> Sir, did you know you had a Starbucks up there? I had a feeling I had a Starbucks up there. But anyway, so you don't hear much about Canada because to get in the news these days, you have to do really shitty things. So if you're in a nice country, no one hears about you, okay? And I read a wonderful thing about a Canadian man in the Financial Times, the curiously pink newspaper that comes out of England that I really like because the A section is some right on news reporting, very astute, well written and to the point. And so I was alone in a hotel room in Stockholm and I saw this beautiful one inch by one inch news bite of information. There's a man from Canada who ventured south into America, into bullet ridden, toxified America and he went to New York City and he went into a Starbucks and he went into the men's room and he, and this is what it said in the article, he managed to somehow crush his penis in the toilet. <laughs> How does one crush his penis in a toilet seat? I'm alone in a hotel room in Stockholm with this information. I have a penis and I have a bathroom and I have a night off and I have a curious mind. I want to know these things, and you see now how desperately, pathetically lonely I am. 
And so I put the newspaper down and I go into the bathroom and I sit on the seat and I go, okay, here I am in the normal position for usage. Now, how do I crush my huang in the toilet? Now, I, I tried to stretch it out in front of me and like, you know, high noon, 12 o'clock on the clock and try to crush it in that part, but it, it, it's, it, it almost made it. It almost made it, but it didn't quite make it. So then I tried to hurl the, the bulk of my huang over the side of my leg, which is more wishful thinking than anything. It kind of, you know, whap, and it's not even close. Okay, so then I tried to tuck it underneath to try to get it over and under. And there again, wishful thinking, it did not work. So, then I approached the bowl on my knees, like many of you have done on a night out. But I was trying to get my huang, the power of my huang. I was trying to get my huang up to the rim to, to, to somehow crush it which I assume that's how he managed to crush his wang. And there again, the, the, the rim is here, I'm nowhere close. So, um, it, it took some, a little bit of doing, but I managed to, basically like this, and I approached the bowl in kind of that, that limbo walk thing that people do at parties. No one ever asked me to go to parties. I haven't been to a party since I was in eighth grade. So, um, there I was in front of the bowl, and now I've got the, the bowl like wrapping around my inner thighs. It's kind of cold, but not so bad. And so I managed to get my huang on the, the rim of the toilet. And having achieved that, I viciously attacked my huang with the seat, uh, causing to, to emit a whap, ow, whap, ow, whap, ow kind of rhythm. And it was a, a hearty whap because it's hitting porcelain and flesh. Whap! And I was like, ah! Because it kind of hurts. But the thing, by the fifth whap, the thing that alarmed me was that it stopped feeling so bad. And it didn't exactly feel good, it just ceased to feel all that bad. And you know that any port in a storm thing that men go through with, we can't fuck you, we'll fuck the couch leg, or anything. And so maybe some guys, whap, whap! And so maybe the Canadian fellow's just trying to get a cheap get off in the bathroom of a Starbucks, and then he wanted to get some money out of it. I don't know. So I, I managed to attack my huang viciously with the toilet seat, and after five whaps, it, it felt pretty good. So I, I wanted to get away from that because I didn't want to have to be so rough trade to my huang on a regular basis in order to get off. Because in the few instances I do get to have sex uh, with somebody else, um, <laughs> I think that would be very hard to ask for. Can you, can you, can you hit my, my wang even harder? <laughs> like, uh, I really don't want to make it standing in a toilet with you hitting your toilet. Please, just, like, well, okay. Oh, yes, yes, mommy, yes. So anyway, I, um, I went from uh, American Canada to, to, to Australia for like the 18th time. Okay, we have the Australian contingent in the house. Here's why so many Australians travel. Because Australia's not going anywhere. Not in the world, it's not moving. And you can leave Australia for years and come back and that motherfucker is still there. And I have gone fairly far and wide across the world and I have been to some pretty hairy places. You walk around downtown Nairobi, it's pretty fucking hairy. Like, you're like, okay, keep your wits about you. <sighs> and then you hear from some distance, Hey, Henry! How you going? It's an Australian guy <laughs> hanging out with the locals. You're like, how long have you been here? I don't know, mate. I've been here for three months. <laughs> So in Australia, you're not all that afraid of the locals. It's the nature you must be afraid of. And to be afraid of nature is a new thing for a jaded city boy like myself. To be afraid of sharks, crocodiles, and snakes is so fucking cool to me. A place that has 10 different varieties of snakes that can kill you in four paces. Not like, oh, oh, my leg hurts. I was bitten by a snake. It's like, fuck, I was bitten. Damn, that venom, some powerful shit. So they have those, and they have this huge continent surrounded by sharks who don't like to take a little nip and go, I'm here. They go, oh! and they maul and destroy surfers every year. And surfers keep putting up with it, which must mean surfing must be pretty great. I've never done it. I'm too much of a, a spaz to get on a surfboard. And so it's an interesting place because you have to be scared of snakes, sharks, and crocodiles. And they have very interesting celebrities. You know, their main exports are Foster's Ale, which they ship to America. Because no Australian drinks Foster's, because basically it's crap. And so 
they ship it to America, and America's like, it's Australian. It comes in a huge can. It must be good. Oh, fuck, this stuff's great. And Australia's like, ah, they fell for it. Woo-hoo-hoo. So we have that, and there's the Crocodile Dundee guy, which is kind of Walt Disney's Australian. And then we have the mild psychotic who's made himself a name all over the world, Steve Irwin, the Crocodile Hunter. Who's... The, people love the guy. He has 1975 short hair Farrah Fawcett do. And he wears the Australian short. The Australian short pant is called the stubby, which is usually favored by big, fat, fuck, working class men who do hard labor. And the, the Australian hardcore working class redneck dude actually has a redneck from working in the sun. This Victoria Bitter inspired beer gut, which is hard as a rock huge forearms and they wear these hot pants that go right up to about here and it is just so weird to see this huge man with this amazing mullet with hot pants it's always a bit more revealing than anyone really wants to know like the first thing in the morning when you're leaving the hotel they're doing the construction across the street i do not want to see lone man ball hanging from from my fucking stubbies mate and, every, and they're always bending down to pick up stuff. And it's like, ooh, ass crack, big fucking hairy puff of hair above ass crack. You're like, ah, thank you. I really didn't need that. Really not what I want to see. But so Australia is kind of cool like that. I was there a while ago, and um, I had a really interesting brush with nature. So I get on this boat with all these people. I'm the only guy alone. Everyone else is a married couple, newlyweds. They're so happy, and they're tan, and they're together. And I'm the weird blazing white guy with the tattoos, the sullen loner who's going to be diving into the water in a pair of gym shorts, which is going to show the gnarliest dick print when I get out. <laughs> and like all vain macho shitheads, I am more worried about the dick print. I'm going to have to try to like, you know, maneuver, like sitting back down on my seat than I am worried about jumping in the water. So we get all the way out to the middle of nowhere and there's, they have this lifeguard on board who's like this just model of just, just physical perfection. He's like a perfect V from his waist to his his armpits and he's like a young Tarzan and he's like all right does everyone have the gear which is like a pair of flippers which I was given and a mask and a snorkel and we're like aye aye (laughs) all right then you're gonna put on your gear jump over the side of the boat splash around a bit see the water if you can try not to urinate in the water disturb the pH of the beautiful barrier reef chances are you will not be eaten by any sharks they will not be feeding in this area for the next 90 minutes if you do see a shark get back to the boat warn the swimmers around you and try and remain calm at all times because if they see that you have any fear they'll bite the shit out of you <laughs> and so I go okay and I'm trying to I'm trying to gather like the pluck and the courage of the typical Australian because you see that mild psychotic Steve Irwin all the time and it's always the same stunt. There he is like I'm gonna go up to this croc and attempt to stick my finger in this croc's ass to see what he'll do and he goes up to like some like mile and a half long you know two ton crocodile here I go let's see what happens Oh, oh, he's a naughty boy. Oh, I'm going to attempt to stick my wife's head down the throat of the crock to see what happens. Oh, no. oh, he's very grumpy. All right, mate. All right, mate. Calm down, mate. He's a very naughty boy. Look, here's another crock I'm going to dive on top of and find a bunch of fucking mud. You know, join me tomorrow when I dive on more aggressive fucking reptilians. So I'm trying to get a little bit of that in me. So anyway. <laughs> so with my, my new courage intact, I jump over the side of the boat in my gear and I make this very unglamorous whoops in the water. I get smacked right in the nuts by the water. And I get all my gear together and I spit in my mask, which you actually do have to do, and put, you know, get your own loogies all over the inside. I put my mask on and I look down into the water and I see 90 million of the most beautiful multicolored fish I have ever seen. It's like the nature channel come to life. There's not like one or two fish. There's more fish than you can fit into your range of vision. And so I go, (gasps) and I go down using my flippers, going straight south. And I get about six feet down and the weight of the Pacific Ocean is like, (sighs) oh my God. There's people like 20 feet below me 
what's the matter with you, you fucking lightweight? I'm like, <laughs> and so I, you know, more breath, and I get down all the way down amongst the fish, and I'm trying to poke at the fish. I don't, I'm not trying to hurt them, I'm not like this, I just want to touch them. And the fish are so at home in the water. You know, just, they sit there, like, it's static, and they have this weird look on their face because their eyes never close, and they're really big, and they're always doing silly things with their mouth, like, and their eyes are like, huh? What are you doing? What the fuck? And they always have this insane look on their face. And I'm like, they will stay this far away from my grip, like an eighth of an inch at all times. And they're not even like, they're like, no, I don't think so. I'm like, and they're like, no. And they still just sit there looking at me like, no, no, no. And I'm like, come on. And I stick my hand into it. There's a ton of them. And they're all like, no, no. And it's like almost every chick I've ever pursued in my life. It's like, like no, my index finger nearly touched the nipple. Fuck, give me the vulva. And they're like, no, I don't think so. No, 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 I'm gonna give it to the skater guy. Fuck you! I shouldn't have said any of that. Too revealing. But anyway, pathetic but true. Back to the bathroom. Whap! Whap! The toilet loves me! So. so like many things in my life, the fish give me no play whatsoever. So I go desperately back up to the top, lungs exploding. I look down again after I got my breath and I see this huge sea turtle underneath me. And he's like, just going right past me. And he's, he's massive and he's so beautiful in the water. He just cuts through the water like effortlessly. I'm like, I'm gonna hang out with the sea turtle. I'm gonna swim with the sea turtle. You know, kind of a new age moment, you know? And so I go after the sea turtle and I'm flapping, I look like shark bait. I'm <laughs> dog paddling and flapping and splashing away, keeping track of him on the top side. And he looks up at me. I'm looking down at him with my mask. He looks up at me with one eye. He's like, and with that one little sea turtle eye, it said so much to me. His eye has a couple of bags underneath. It looks like Duke Ellington. He's like, Fucking tourists. <laughs> Motherfucker, this is my living room. This is my living room, and every 45 minutes I have some fucking guy like you trying to follow me. You want to follow me? You think you can follow a sea turtle? You're out of your element. You think I'm going fast now? This is first gear. Now you're going to see sea turtle in third gear. And with no effort, he goes like, Ooh, I'm like, Motherfucker, he's like just leaving me. I'm like, <laughs> And I just start following, and he looks up, and he's like, and he disappears. And I valiantly go after him for at least, you know, another 30 seconds, and he is gone, leaving a trail of bubbles. I break the water. I look behind me. The boat is this big. <laughs> on t little tiny man on top of the little tiny boat. It's the lifeguard. <laughs> and like half a minute later, you dumb motherfucker! <laughs> And so I'm like, don't worry. And this is where being a macho shithead will get you killed. <laughs> I was in that undertow riptide thing. I was on my way back to America. The idea of drowning occurs to me. I get full of a little bit of panic, like, fuck, I could drown. It's a long way to the boat. But then I reckon, oh, well, the boat is a motor. If I'm in real trouble, they'll just jam over here and grab me. I'm sure it happens every once in a while. So I had a little bit of fear of drowning. And then the macho bullshit element takes over. My main fear, fear of humiliation by being rescued by a guy like 15 years younger than me in much better physical condition than I would ever hope to be at my prime. This young Tarzan guy is going to valiantly jump in the water, make it 30 seconds that took me th two and a half minutes to do, and tow me in against the riptide, get me back to the boat so I can be stared at by everyone. And everyone's staring at me already because I'm the one with all the artwork on his body, and I'm like, you know, blinding pale white. Now I'm also going to be the guy who's dragged back by the big red lifesaver ring around me by Johnny Weissmuller Jr. I will not have this. I'd rather drown. So I contemplated, fuck it, I'll just take two big mouthfuls fulls of water, I'll just sink like a stone, by the time it gets out to me, I'll be dead and I won't have to fuck with it. And so I'm like, okay, 
Death of drowning, no fear. Humiliation, huge fear. Back to the boat I go. I'm like, ah, ah, and the guy's like, here I come. I'm like, don't worry, I'm fine. I know dick about swimming. I haven't swum like in open water since like 1980 something. So I'm like, ah, I'm swimming like for three minutes. I totally use up all the energy I have. I've gone about seven feet. Fear of humiliation gets me all the way back to the boat. By the time I get within five feet of the boat, all the other, you know, divers are kind of splashing around, looking at the spaz who is halfway to America, who valiantly dog paddled back. I am so weak from exhaustion. I can't even get my hands above the water. I'm doing that survival float I learned in Senior Lifesavers in 1850. Like, I think you go... I can barely get my lips over the surface of the water. My hands are like limp from like paddling. And everyone's like, are you okay? My mask is now around my neck, strangling me. My snorkel's hitting me in the back of my head. My flippers are like halfway up my legs. You know, they're just fucked. And I'm like, never better. <laughs> Try not to vomit the seawater that consumes, that's like, you know, two thirds of my lungs is seawater, starfish, you know, whatever. And so the lifeguard's like, oh, I nearly had to come in and rescue you. And I'm like, <laughs> I was just doing some marine biology research, this project I'm working on, on uh, uh, C. turtleus uh, pacificus, uh, oh, fuck you. And I get back on the boat, I'm trembling with exhaustion, I'm like, <laughs> and I sit down, like, coughing up water all the way back, and I sit next to this, like, 80-year-old woman who swam like a dolphin the whole time. <laughs> She's like, are you all right? And I'm like, <laughs> hey, fuck you, okay? <laughs> hey, old lady, fuck you. So anyway, that was my, you know, some of the many interesting, fascinating, I know, riveting trips to Australia. So there's this, this uh, ritual I usually do from Australia to Europe, which I, is a, a normal trade route for me to go to Australia and then come to Europe. The airplane always dumps you out in Bangkok, Thailand. And you have like the three hour layover where you stand, and many of you have done this, right? You stand in the Bangkok, Thailand airport and you stand very still and the air is moist in about 103 and you don't want to move for fear of sweating in clothes you're going to be living in for the next 16 hours. So be very still, think cool and placid thoughts. Because the last thing you want to do is get that one initial drop of sweat to drop behind your clothes because it'll be the, the, the shower of sweat. And you can always feel that first little drop of butt sweat cond you know, it's condensing right above the crack of your ass. And you can feel the tingling as it clings to all the little moisture particles are clinging to the little butt hairs over your ass crack. And you're like, no, please, please. And then you hear, boit. And you're like, oh, here we go. You know, Amazonian rainstorm down the crack of your ass. And so anyway, you can do that or you can grab a cab, go into Bangkok, get yourself a cheap hotel and kick it in Bangkok, which is incredibly polluted, funky, cheap and very friendly. And also it's a sex town. And so we have all kinds of weirdos who go there to get it on with 13 year old girls. And uh, you know, me, I'm not a pedophile, no interest there, just to reassure you. And so I went, into, I went into Bangkok, took the cab in, get my hotel room, and I go back out onto the streets of like one in the morning Bangkok, which is like 102 degrees, total tropical funk. And I'm walking towards this convenience store I always go to to get the bottle of mineral water. 30 cab drivers are across the street. They see a lone Caucasian man walking. They think I have only one mission in mind, have sex with a 13-year-old girl. They all come running at me. Get in my cab, get in my cab. I mean, th these guys are all pimps on wheels because they all work for different Thai love houses. And if they get you into the one they sponsor, they get six liters of gasoline. So they really want to get you into their cab and get you to their Thai love house. So these men come running up to you with laminated cards of photos of little naked girls. It's like a menu for sex. It is really bizarre. And they're like, look! And I'm like, wow, I really don't want to look at 13-year-old naked chicks. It doesn't do a thing for me. Call me strange. And I go, no, thank you. I need mineral water. And I keep on walking, and they just think that I haven't heard them. No, 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 you don't understand. We get you fucking and massage. You come with me. I go, I, I understand. You want me to go with you. I go to the Thailand love house, I get it on with an 11 year old girl. Right! No thank you, I want mineral water. <laughs> Have a nice night, here's your laminated menu back. Do, 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 do. And I keep on going towards the convenience store and they all look at me like, fuck.
what's his problem? I don't know. And so I, I get my mineral water. I come out. See, fellas, I wasn't kidding. <laughs> See, these guys have no idea who they're fucking with. They are fucking with a lean, mean, tattooed, rated G Boy Scout, which is what I am. I don't want to go pay for sex. I don't want to have sex with a child. I, I want the mineral water. And so I'm sitting outside the hotel doing something really lame, just sitting alone, looking into the foggy, murky night with my bottle of mineral water, sweating more than I'm sweating now. Because everything you do just makes you sweat in this place. So I'm sitting there sweating, drinking the water, having a great time. Cab driver comes over to me, goes, you know something? You crazy. I go, I know. <laughs> so I'm told. He goes, he goes, you better come over and hang out with us. I said, fucking A. You got it, buddy. So I went over there and I hung out with the cab drivers. And they, they all have this table and all these chairs. They, they give me a chair. I sit down. They put a, a glass in front of me. They throw in three or four ice cubes. And they pour in like three fingers of whiskey. Like, whoa, 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 no, no thanks, I don't drink. I go, are you guys drinking whiskey? They're like, yeah. And I look at them, they're all fucked up. They're like, you don't want any? I'm like, no, I'm, uh, no, no thanks. And then one by one, they all get up and introduce themselves. My name is Big Tiger. Ah! He nearly falls over backwards. This is the guy who wanted to drive me. Another guy gets up, I am King Mafia. Ah, uh, and they're all fucked up. I go, you guys are all drunk. They're like, yeah. You're cab drivers. Yeah. You're going to drive around drunk? Yeah. <laughs> Good night. And I, I went back to my hotel. So the next morning, I come bounding outside, ready to go. And I'm assaulted by cab drivers. And this time, I actually do want a cab. And they come running up. You want cab? I went, yes, I do. And they're like... No, you come with me. No, you come with me. And they're showing me the laminated pages of naked chicks. I'm like, no, thank you. And I go with this one guy who was standing next to me. And we get in the cab. And he goes, okay, so we take you for a massage. And then we take you for fucking. I went, no, sir. I want to go to the zoo. <laughs> and we're driving down this little street. And he's like, mm, no sex club called zoo. I go, no, 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 no. I want to go to the Bangkok Zoo. Animals! And I showed him my camera. I have a camera! I want to take photos of animals! <laughs> and and he, the look on his face, he's like... <sighs> but then he gets all pumped up again, and the three-ring binder of naked chicks sails into the back seat. And I'm like, I throw it right back. I go, no, no, no. I just want to see the tapers and the crocodiles. And you know, he's like, okay. And then he regroups. Okay, okay. We go to zoo. Then we get massage, we go to Thai Love House, make you big happy. I went, nope, you, you want to make me big happy? Take me to see the crocodiles. It's like, okay. And he's all bummed out. Sure you no want to see Thai Love Girl? No, I don't want to see any of them. Okay. Maybe you change mind. Never. Okay, we get to the zoo. He's now so bummed out that he's not gonna get to take me to the Thai love house. He's sitting outside, sitting on the, on the hood of his car. You go ahead, I wait for you here. <laughs> I go, oh, what's the matter? I wanna go Thai love house. I don't wanna go zoo, zoo, stupid, just a bunch of animals. And so I went back up to the gate, and for like a dollar and ten cents, I bought him another ticket. And I said, come on, I got you a ticket for the zoo. Come on. I don't want to go in zoo. I go, oh, cheer up, Bunky. Come on, let's go see the zoo. I'll show you the animals. Like, well, okay. <laughs> and I took him through a tour of the zoo. It was so much fun. I got him to cheer up. And I did this whole photo session where I made him stand next to all these animals. And I took all these photos of him. It's this digital camera. You get like nine million shots per little disc of information. So I have him like standing next to these fucking huge animals. I go, okay. He's just like, I go, oh, come on, put some life into it. At least point to the animal. And he, so he started like, you know, like, and by like the 15th shot, he got all into it, you know, like, and he's, he's all pumped up about it. Then I get him into the reptile house and I go, okay, you see that? That's Ophiophagus Hannah. That means king of the snake eating snakes. This is a king cobra. One bite of it can kill an elephant. Isn't that fucking cool? And to me, it, it really is. And I'm so amazed that I get to take a photo of a real big Ophiophagus Hannah. My heart is leaping up and down. My nipples are erect, and he's <laughs> bored to death. And I said, come on, put some life into it. I have this photo of this guy next to these, these two king cobras who are on the, in their little cage, and they're like, Ugh. and there he is like, <laughs> me 
you know, Fio Vegas Hannah. And so we took them all through the zoo and we visited the primates and I have all these wonderful photos of this guy who's thoroughly pissed off that we're not going to the Thai Love House to get our dicks washed. So anyway, the next day, you know, I have my other day off. I go back to the airport and I go back to the funky, stanky Bangkok airport and I get loaded on that bus like a sardine. The bus that holds 50 people, they put 150 people on, which is kind of a turn on because you get to smell all, kind of like this big human uh, funk. And I've got my face like buried in some woman's hair. And I'm kind of, you know, just by sheer proximity, I'm starting to grind into her ass, <laughs> which is, you know, more action than I get, you know, for Coon's age. And so I'm like, oh, that's not so bad. And hopefully we'll be taking a, a left turn. I'll be, oh. And she looks behind, I'm like, sorry, you know, the bus. She's like, fuck, okay. And I got my face in her hair and I'm, I can feel her ass with my dick. I'm like, oh, this is not so bad. I hope the bus ride's really long. And then I feel something pressing into me. And you know how you can sense things with parts of your body. It's not like exactly like your ass cheeks can read Braille. But you know when some guy's package is pressing into you, you can go, uh-huh, uh-huh, I, I can feel the ears in the trunk. Yes, indeed. And there's some, there's a, a cock and ball set, an ensemble piece grinding into my ass. I'm like, oh, this is like a porn film. You know, it's like a, a sandwich and I, I turn around and the, the guy's like sorry man there's nowhere else I can go and then we, we take that left turn it's like, uh, I'm like oh mm, what seat are you sitting in so anyway it's a long flight and so um, we got to the airplane and there is another abrupt cultural change because it's a Lufthansa flight and when you enter a Lufthansa flight you basically enter into Germany and, and Germany's no bad place to be. But going from Thailand to Germany and still be in, in like seven minutes is really intense. And you walk into the, into the Lufthansa 747 and it is like fucking freezing. And all your butt sweat and accumulated sweat makes your clothes freeze to your body. So you're like, <gasps> and you're blowing steam. And like the woman goes, do you need to be taken to your seat? Or are you smart enough to know that 7B means going down 7 and then going to B, sitting down and shutting the fuck up? <laughs> and there is something really intimidating about a woman who's beautiful, six inches taller than you, who doesn't smile. It makes you feel shorter than you usually do around chicks. And my lot in life is I'm short, so I'm always looking up to women like, And so this woman is like, Welcome to Lufthansa. And there's this huge melon breast, spun gold hair tied back in a knot, long legs, that gunmetal blue skirt, the, the tight blouse, oh, and everything. Honor says, Tear these clothes off me. I'll turn into wild woman. I will give you sex that you never could believe. And if you just kind of look at her like, oh, What's your name? She's like, Little man, you see my body and weep. It is beautiful, no? You wonder what my breasts look like. You nor any man will ever see them. This beautiful vulva, no man has ever seen it. No man ever will see it. I will have sex with no man. I am only on this planet to torment men, to send men into bathrooms to mutilate their wang with a toilet seat. You should have seen what I did to a man from Toronto a few weeks ago. He made the newspapers. That is because of me. <laughs> and so 11 hours of Lufthansa. It's just so weird. And then I get out in Germany and it's the Frankfurt airport. We have a mile and a half run to the next airplane. So you get into the next airplane and you're covered with even more butt sweat and you haven't slept for 30 hours. So by the time you get to Europe, you're totally fucked out of your mind. And so I did Scandinavia into Germany, then into England. And it's just been an amazing wild trip. So now that I told you how I got here, I can proceed with everything else. Okay, so here's this thing that happened to me recently. I turned 40 this February, which is kind of weird because age 40 has connotations of adulthood, maturity, and somehow having a pair of balls, having to be a man at the same time. Three things I'm, I'm failing at. And so the whole adulthood thing I have a major problem with because for me, adulthood is synonymous with compromise, mediocrity, and people giving up their dreams. Because when you're young and you're pissed off, no one thinks twice about you. Ah, oh, young, pissed off, great. When you're my age and you're pissed off, everyone just says, oh, you're just bitter. 
And if you are young and you have a lot of energy, everyone goes, well, yeah, of course, you're supposed to have a lot of energy. Bing, bing, bing. A young person lives on one bag of top ramen noodles, a chocolate bar, and a can of Coca-Cola once a year feeding. 90 seconds of sleep a day. And that's it. Like, 89, 90. Ha! young person unable to be contained and if you're my age and you have a lot of energy everyone has to tell you you know you have a lot of energy for someone your age (laughs) do i or am i just around a bunch of people who gave up the fucking struggle if you're young and you're intense Everyone says, well, right on, because youth and intensity go together. Because you guys, you know how you are. Like, what's the matter, man? Fuck, I've got a girlfriend. Fuck. Cool, man. No, fuck. It's, uh. And then she leaves. Fuck, man, she left me. Fuck. Everything is intense. You know, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow is another day. Fuck, another day. Fucking intense. Okay. And everyone goes, well, he's young. He's intense. When you're my age and you're intense, everyone goes, oh, my God, you're so fucking weird. So that's me, the weird, bitter man with sprightly, old man, unnatural energy. Weird, like Fred Astaire, bitter too, and really weird. By the time I'm 80, I want to be like Dennis Hopper was in Apocalypse Now. You motherfuckers will have abandoned me by then. I'll come back to the Astoria. It'll just be me, this monitor guy in the front of house guy. Yeah, Henry, you'll all be gone. You'll have forgotten me. You'll, you'll leave me. And I'll be, be there like, hey, man, don't you know what I'm talking about, man? Can't you keep the real man? And everyone will be like, wow, he's whew. But that's how I'm going to get around the midlife crisis. I've seen so many guys my age, they totally fuck up. They start thinking they're not man enough because they start hanging out and having intense relationships with women. And when boys go out with girls, it's one thing. But when men go out with women, it's a whole new way to be. Because you know what happens when boys turn into men? Fuck all happens, okay? And you guys know that. You basically go from 18 to 35, and the only thing that you do is you rationalize all the swirling bullshit in your life, and you turn it into law. Like when you were 18, you never washed your clothes. You kept it in, in the moldering pile in the front of your hovel. Now you're 35, you still don't do your laundry. But you rationalize that you can, like, peel a shirt off the moldering, butt-crusted pile of stenching clothes, drape said article of clothing over the back of a chair, And in two days, it will magically air clean itself. And that is a method of cleaning employed by every man. It is called air cleaning. All men are in love with their body odor. So a guy can, like, take a pair of underwear, wear it for a week and a half, put it over his head, ass first, and walk around in his room and just be good. Like, fuck, damn, man. Fuck, it's turning me on. I smell great. You know, even vintage me smells great. And, and, you know, you are, you have this pulverizing body funk, which you think, I'm a walking sex machine. Everyone else is like, and women just go, oh, fuck, he's still a boy. And so women get more and more frustrated as they get older because they have to deal with men. And so men don't grow, really. We're, We're just boys with less hair, bigger asses, and badder attitudes. The change from girl to woman, however, is super substantial. It's huge. And they go from one thing to another thing, like overnight it seems. Like overnight, girl turns into woman. Bam! She wakes up with like 30 new shades of blue that she can see. This whole, you know, attachment to her emotions. Like she thinks her emotions and her feelings are real. Which makes men just go, And she's uploaded magically with 90 gigabytes as to the innermost hardcore workings of the, of the male psyche. And no man can ever bullshit a woman, which puts conversation into this kind of stasis because we don't know what to say to you unless we're trying to bullshit you to get your clothes off. <laughs> and so women get to a certain age and their ovaries start going, now. And they start laying the heavy wrap on their boyfriend or husband. And they put their hand on the man's shoulder. I want to have children. And there's no someday. At the end of it, there's like Friday. And the eyes go like lock the guy. And he's like, he can't leave. And he looks into her eyes and sees the screaming ovarian time clock ticking backwards. Every menstrual cycle is a fucking apple falling off the tree of fertility. 29. 28, 27, almost Nancy Reagan, 
Sing. Sing. And so they get really intense on that. And men have no concept of the intensity of that kind of biochemistry. Because our half of the bargain is always accompanied by pleasure. <laughs> it is thoroughly anonymous. Only one tadpole gets entry. We'll give you like 60 million per shot. So it's not like we can go, okay, we're going to conceive with this guy. We just like, come on, fellas, run! And, the, and we can supply our half of the bargain like five times a day. And if we're just like good time Charlie, which infuriates the fuck out of women. They're bleeding, they're sitting over toilets. We're like, felt good. Here, it's good for your skin. And, <laughs> and so when women get bad feelings about things. I don't think we should get on this plane. Why the fuck not? I have a bad feeling about this flight. You have a bad feeling about this flight? That goes against the male gospel. Have you had a word with a pilot? Well, no. Have you looked over today's flight plan and made sure all the clouds are in the right place? Well, no. Have you inspected the outside of the plane to make sure the wings are on, the engines are all going perfectly? No. So you think this flight's gonna go down and break into the ocean in a million pieces and kill everyone on board because you have a bad feeling about it? Yes. <laughs> you women are so fucked up! You need men to run shit! No, oh, fuck you! And so that's, that's the constant thing, okay? Men know all women are psycho bitches. <laughs> women know men are just a bunch of dumb motherfuckers. We're good for a few things. We build the buildings, we build the cars, we fix the cars, we erect the mighty, you know, love pillar. Past that, uh, uh, I'm right about everything. Yeah, sure you are, Goliath. See you later. And women do that thing to men. They can thoroughly emasculate a man in like one sentence, so deftly, so precisely. It's like a smart bomb that hits the target. They use the C word. C-O-W-A-R-D. Coward. They say that to a guy. You fucking coward! That, the, that just rips the kneecaps out of a guy. His backbone goes slack. He's like, I'm a, I'm a coward? Ha, ha. How can this little bony chick call me a coward? And somehow, even though he doesn't know what he's done, he knows somehow she's right. Like, you fucking coward! And you, oh, oh. Let us be in! Yeah, you don't know how to react. And so, I've tried to see how I fit into all of this, because I know somehow I fit in. And we live in a very consumerist culture, right? You are, to a certain degree, uh, you can tell how you fit into the big swim by how you are being marketed to. Like if you are 18 to 25 or 105, whatever it is, you are somebody's demographic. You are some company's target. And if you're 18 to 25, Sony has it in their twisted minds that there's 80 records a week that they make that you need to have so they can make a bunch of money off you. And every clothing agency has 90 pairs of stupid looking baggy pants for you to put on Every piercing and tattoo place wants to put like five pounds of metal in your lips, ears, and nose. And if you're my age, no one's trying to sell you anything except life insurance, hardcore pharmaceutical drugs, a hole in the ground, and the best of sting. <laughs> and when someone comes up to you and hands you the best of sting, you realize that basically somehow you are dead. Basically it says to me, I no longer exist. I'm no longer a warrior. I'm no longer a Maasai lion killer. I am a village elder. I am the guy who sits in the dirt, mixing the gruel, waiting for the hunters to come back from the hunt. And so I am basically a non-entity in society. And so right around that time, I went into the bathroom one morning and looked at my face in the mirror. I'd just gotten up. And I see these lines on either side of my mouth. And I'm like, what the fuck? how those get there? And it's not the kind of lines you have in your face when you wake up after a night on the crinkly pillow. You know those lines. You get up, you go in the mirror, these lines going down your face. You're like, that's kind of cool, actually. <laughs> you look like Tom Berenger in Platoon. Like, yeah, hey, look at me. <laughs> you kind of want him to hang out for a few days because it makes you look street. <laughs> so these are like these two lines on either side of my mouth. And they're deep, too. Like you pull them open, socks fall out. You always wonder where those fucking socks go. And they're really big and deep. And it's not like they happened overnight. I'm like, how, how 
how come I didn't notice these before? And I think that we all have a certain amount of, of denial that we carry with us all the time, looking into the mirror like, you look great, Mwah, you are the man. And so the lines had to become so deep in my face that not even my personal bullshit could obscure them any longer. And so there are these big, deep, old lines. I'm pulling them back, and like there's vacationing Belgians inside. Hello? We are hiding in here. And I let them go back inside. And so I wondered, what have I been doing on such a regular basis that I fatigued the skin so much that it now has a fold? So I'm very practical, being a guy. Logic works for me. You know, I feel I have a line in my face. Either you do or you don't. The fucking chicks are nuts. And so I'm like, what am I doing? Because everything happens for a reason in the world of the man. Like, so what, what facial characteristic do I have that is putting these lines into my face? So I basically looked into the mirror and I made every face that I use on a normal day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Which is, as you well know, pretty much all I've got. So it didn't make the lines go. So then I looked into the mirror and I smiled. I smiled and that's what I have. I have smile lines, one here, one there. You know what a fucking insult it was for me to have smile lines? Me? The man? For 21 years, nothing has been funny. But that's funny. Shut up! What about that? That's pretty funny. Shut up! Nothing is funny! My theory is, I've been smiling in my sleep. That's gotta be it. I'm smiling in my sleep. All 90 minutes of it I get every night. Usually around one in the morning, I pass out and the very rage that courses through my body wakes me up at about 1.30 and I wake up, ah, ah, and until then, I'm like, mm. so that's it, that's my theory. I smile in my sleep because I certainly don't smile when I'm awake, God damn it, because the world's on fire, how can you smile? So that's the kind of bullshit I'm full of. Okay, um, as an American, I have a lot of apologizing to do to you people. I am sorry for so much stuff. Okay, but you know that I'm not responsible. I'm not the one who put the psycho moron cowboy in, in the presidential office. I didn't invent Ally McBeal. I know. And I'm sorry we have a big, ignorant, stupid guy who can't put together more than three sentences without inventing a new word. He speaks and he, he comes up with a verbal typo. And he, like the other day, he came up with a new word. He came up with the word strategic. He was trying to say the word strategic. And it was something about uh, what he's going to do about the U.S. arms situation. Well, we need to build more uh, weaponry because, uh, well, because it's strategic. Uh, strategic. We need a strategy and we need to follow this strategy and make it into a plan that can be followed for people who need a plan to follow. Because it's necessary that we do this. Because they said so. And I can't believe I'm president. Thank you. Anyways, and have you noticed another thing about the psycho stupid cowboy fuckhead? That when he runs out of knowledge, when he figures out 29 seconds into the 90 second soundbite that he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, this, this smirk of fear creeps up on this side of his face and he starts to use his hands. And so the other day, he's saying, well, we, we need uh, more gasoline sources in America, so we're gonna build more sources to make gasoline. And then the smirk comes. He goes, uh-oh, now, now he's going to improvise. Now he's going to kick a little improv live at, the American, live at the Oval Office, you know, live at the improv. And he starts using his hands. We're going to start making uh, hybrids. Hybrids. He didn't say hybrid car, which I think he was trying to get to the point of a hybrid car which utilizes electricity and gasoline to lessen the use of gasoline because electricity apparently is a little cheaper and cleaner to make. And he didn't say car, so he's just talking about these hybrids. And I'm wondering, like, what is he going to hybridize? Like, is it, like, oh, we're getting coconuts and, and cows and we're, <laughs> it's gonna be a tough fit and the cows are gonna be screaming, but uh, we're, it's, well, it's a lot easier than trying to put the cow in the coconut. We, we tried that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because I don't. And if I use my hands enough, maybe you somehow will understand me. And that smirk on the side of his face basically says, how the fuck did I get this job? Can you tell? Because I sure don't understand why. 
I thought how groovy it would be to like be president and my administration would last a week. And like if I, if I ran, I would do something really wacky. I would only tell the truth. I would campaign and just tell the truth and have the coolest soundbite CNN has ever recorded. Because they have those silly presidential debates and all they do is cut each other down. But it's really mild. Like, well, my worthy opponent makes a very good point. But what he fails to realize is, belittle and patronize, ha, ha, ha. I would just go, get right to the point. You know what? You're a stupid bitch and I want you to shut the fuck up. <laughs> you know, and people on, would be watching like, fuck, that guy was rad. I disagree with everything he said, but he told the other guy to shut the fuck up. I'm voting for him. That shit was cool. And so I'd get, I'd get elected. And um, <laughs> my... <laughs> My campaign would be the fuck your freedom campaign because we really don't have any. We have privilege. We don't have e equality or freedom. We have privilege. And so I'd say, well, fuck your freedom. You don't have any. Ooh, God damn, you're right. You, you rock, man. Because I always wanted a president or any kind of leader anywhere that I'd be into as much as I'm into uh, Al Green. Wouldn't it be cool to love your, love your leader as much as you love Al Green or John Coltrane or the Ramones? Where like the guy would come up and speak, you'd be like, fuck, I so they're like, oh, God, here we go, you know? And that's why I like your, your guy, because when he speaks, you're like, wow, that's a well-put-together sentence. <laughs> and my guy's, well, we have a united America, and you can see that the states are united. If you look at the map, they're very close together. <laughs> Almost like they were made that way to fit. <laughs> and we need a prosperous America, because to not be prosperous is to be unprosperous, <laughs> and that can't be as good. Thank you. And he walks away. I was like, that was bullshit, right? Yeah, that sucked. We voted for him? Yeah. What, what happened? I don't know. I hope we don't get blowed up. Mm. And so I would get elected in my little fantasy, you know, and you can tell a guy like me has a lot of time on his own to whack his, his wang in the toilet and think he's the president. And so that's me trying to get the thing the other 19 other guys want. And so day one, as president, I would go after my favorite group I love to hate, my favorite hate group that I love to hate, the Ku Klux Klan. Um, not, perhaps not the most dangerous of the white power organizations in America. I think there's probably more that are more militant, but it is the corniest and the more, uh, it's the most embarrassing one to wear when outside of America. Because everyone in the world knows what a Klansman looks like. They're in mommy's bed sheet, you know, with a pillowcase on the head, just uh, thoroughly horrible. And every year they keep coming back. It's like 2001, they're still around. And you, you know, fellas, it's 2001. Why don't you evolve into the new millennium and cut the crap? So day one in office, I get to do whatever I want. I'm the president, by the way. And so I get in, I look at my cum encrusted carpet in the Oval Office and <laughs> try and get the, the, the big bits out of the way. So I'll be doing this in bare feet, you know, so I'll be feeling all of them. And so I get on the phone with uh, all the leading fashion moguls of today, the most avant and challenging ones we've got. And I go, okay, gang, I need 3,000 of the wildest clan outfits you can put together. You know what the clan outfit looks like. Use it as a basic template and just go off. Any fabric, any hemline, any color, go. I need 3,000 now. Bill me. Go, go, go. We, we can do this thing and they get to work. <laughs> and so at this time, I put together a crack team called the Clan Chaos Disruption Team. The Clan Chaos Disruption Team is 3,000 people. Actually, 3,000 men. I don't want to keep the women out. But this is a focus group. You'll see why. Okay, 3,000 men. Now, there's also another thing you need to be to be in the Clan Chaos Disruption team. You need to be a guy. You need to be gay. I need 3,000 gay men. Now, I can widen the parameters slightly. To be in the Clan Chaos Disruption team, you can be black or Jewish. So what I want is 3,000 men who embody three things the Klan cannot handle. Gays, Jews, blacks. And that's all you'd have in the Klan Chaos Disruption Team. So, within a day, all my guys are in their outfits. 3,000 hot, hunky, gay, black, and Jewish fellows waiting for the Klan to march. And so they come to New York City, and all my guys would be in the bushes waiting, waiting for the Klan to come down Madison Avenue. And they all have in-ear monitors so they can hear my command. And when they hear, join the parade, join the parade, join the parade, they join the parade. And my guys come to the parade armed with 
pogo sticks and tricycles. So in come the clan chaos disruption team. Boing, boing. 3,000 brightly dressed men pogoing and tricycling down Madison Avenue, inspiring the sheer hatred and fury of the 25 real Klansmen. You sons of bitches, get out of our parade! Boing, boing. And New Yorkers are watching, and how afraid of anybody can you be if they're on a pogo stick? We're the bringers of white pride, boing, boing. Yeah, whatever. Ah, the clan looks good. Look at these nice outfits. I haven't seen a pogo stick. I haven't seen a man on a pogo stick ever. I've never seen a clansman on a pogo stick. This is crazy. And so people start going, wow, maybe the clan is loosening up. And right at that time, all the newscasters get there to do their 15-second soundbite. I'm here at the, at the clan parade. And so soon as they start broadcasting, and they've already said, well, the, the clansmen are showing a bit of color this time around, breaking away from the traditional white gowns. They are sporting pogo sticks and tricycles for the occasion. And right at that time, when the eyes of the world are upon the Klan parade, and everyone's going, wow, the Klan can show color, that's when I scream into the monitors, phase two, phase two, phase two. Hoods come off. Tricycles and pogo sticks are thrown to the curb. Everybody, grab a partner, start making out. 3,000 men deeply and passionately tongue kissing in front of the eyes of the world. And all the newsmen no longer know what to do. They're listening to the in ear monitor to be told what to say. Uh, the Klan. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, the, the, the Klan is showing a, a new and uh, avant uh, tolerance towards uh, race creed and sexual orientation this seems to run counter to the last uh, few hundred years of the clan's practice uh, it is a new dawn for the clan and right around this time it's time for the usual clan uh, press conference where they get the grand dragon and which is not the name i would call myself if i want people to take me seriously and so usually the grand dragon has this quasi racist statement like we're not against colored people we're just standing up for the rights of the white man which is really lame so anyway he's duct taped inside of a phone booth he, he's not going to be making any press conference on this day my clan chaos disruption team is thoroughly democratic if you are the one closest to the microphones, you are the leader of the clan on that day. So I've got one clan, one of my clan guys near the microphones, and I go, just go for it. You're the head of the clan. Just do a, just improvise. Okay, great. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, okay. Um, are those on? Do I just like just go? Right. Uh, okay. Well, this is it. Um, oh man, I always thought this time would come. Um, Okay, 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 I can do this, I can do this. We are the KKK. We're black, Jewish, and gay. We're here in New York City, and I think we're going to stay. Hello, Manhattan! The streets erupt with applause. By Sunday afternoon, everybody knows each other, and the only people who aren't having a good time are the 25 original Klansmen <laughs> who go home and defeat like, that sucked. <laughs> Shit. So I predict the Klan goes from like 5,000 down to three, because it's no longer cool to be in the Klan. So you're in the Ku Klux Klan. That's right, buddy, I am. So you're one of them uh, high dress and fags who jumps around and kisses everybody? Oh, shit! Quit! And so the clan just goes down to nothing because it's, it's not cool anymore to hate and, you know, be an asshole. And so on day two, I would, uh, that's when I start getting the hate mail on day two because I would start affecting uh, righteous and well-aimed censorship. Because I think right now we are in the middle of one of the worst periods of music the world has ever seen. I don't know which came first, shitty rave music or the drugs, okay? <laughs> Like, did these guys make it come up, you know, get their Macintosh computers out and hire DJ Fuckhead <laughs> and get a drummer to come in and go, doo, 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 doo. okay, thank you, you can leave. You know, they, they sampled it. Doo, 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 doo. I'm fuck, fuck, fuckhead, DJ fuck, fuckhead. I have no t -t 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 talent, I have no talent, no talent. I play other people's r r r r records, records. <laughs>
My friends, there is nothing like going to a Euro music festival and hanging out with these like super self-important guys who carry suitcases of records. And what are you? I'm a musician, man. I'm a DJ. You're a fucking thief of music. You're a record player player. You're a DJ turntable. You can take a Sam Cooke record. You can take Sam Cooke's sweat and make it sound like something different because you go, Vick, 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 Vick. you can kiss my fucking ass, okay? Fuck, I guess I'm just an over-the-hill 40-year-old curmudgeon who's totally lost the plot, but I think that shit sucks. But anyway, so, so you have that... Oh, wow, it's jungle trance hip-hop fucking shit music. And so... I wonder if it was just these, these non-music fuckheads who are, you know, sitting in their house one day and they dicked around on a Macintosh, they go, listen, get the drum sample. Here, put that on a white label 12 inch, send it to the clubs. Wow, man, you're brilliant, we'll put you on the cover of NME. You're fucking genius, man, you're fucking genius. Okay, so I wonder what came first, the shitty music or the drugs? So you make music that shitty and everyone sits around and goes, God, this sucks. No, no, take these drugs. Play the, play the record again. Fuck, that's so good! <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> or, were there just a bunch of people sitting in a warehouse with a bunch of ketamine and an ecstasy, and they took a bunch of it, and someone said, here, now make some music. Yeah, man, right. Uh, uh, do a, 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 a thing, yeah. Fuck, 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 head. Dun, 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 dun. Fuck, 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 head. Dun, 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 dun. Right, and so I have always wondered what came first, the, the shitty music or the shitty drugs. But it's all come together in a really beautiful way. And so I would seek to basically censor some of these people so we could get back to some other shit and maybe get some real jazz and some real R&B and some real soul and some real rock and roll and all the other groovy stuff too, but just less of the dairy freeze. <sighs> Here's your CD. <sighs> Here's your CD. Because if you listen to like modern rock radio, you'll hear like six songs, one after the other, and they all sound like about the first half of a really boring, mediocre CD. When you find out it's six different bands, that's what's really bad, because Pro Tools and vocal pitching has made all these bands sound the same, and they all seem to utilize the same singer, who does that, yeah, hell yeah, yeah, and you can never tell what they say in the verse. It's like, oh, my name so messy, yeah, yeah, like, what the fuck? Fuck, is that the Creed bitch or the days of the new guy? And it's just like, yeah, 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 yeah. And these guys step down on a power cord. It's like, pring. Like, what the fuck happened, you guys? Where's the balls? I mean, are, are these people born with that testosterone? I mean, I just remember when I was 18, I wanted to fuck on the floor and break shit. When I was 25, I wanted to fuck on the floor and break shit. When I was 35, I wanted to fuck on the floor and break shit. Now I'm 40, I want to fuck on the floor and break shit. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> Why are all these rock bands so nice now? Aren't, aren't there people around who just like want to put on a record and like wreck everything in sight? Fuck! And so I, I would want to just obliterate some of this stuff. So my presidency would only be five days long because I would be killed on the fifth day because we'd, I'd be having way too much fun. And someone would go, oh, enough of that, boom, and I'd be dead. But until I'd be dead, I would have James Brown's backing band as my, just would be with me all the time, would be my, my house band. So everywhere I went, there'd always be a groove. And as president, I could just get, yell out, Maceo! And Maceo Park would be right there, and he'd hit me with a sax solo any time I wanted, because I am the president. And whenever I needed any kind of reassuring or backup, I would have Bobby Bird, the guy who would, who would say to James, get on up! I would have him with me all the time. Can I do the press conference? Do the press conference! Can I tell them what it's all about? Tell them what it's all about! Can I do it now? Do it now! And so anytime I go to a press conference, Maceo hit me, and I'd have the whole band with me, and I'd get the big intro, I'd have Kiss's pyrotechnic team to wire every single event I ever did. Like, ladies and gentlemen, from the cum encrusted carpets of the Oval Office, he's your president! So there'd be smoke, there'd be fire, there'd be music, and there'd be me. And so wherever I went, 
Maceo! And so anyway, I would, instead of having Secret Service guys, boring men in blue suits, I would have Worldwide Federated Wrestler guys <laughs> in, like, in, in like spandex hot pants with shoulder holsters with Uzis, samurai top knots and little tiny mirrored shades so they look thoroughly insane. And they'd always be looking around for someone to fight. They'd be like... <laughs> and looking confused and psychotic. And anyone who looked at me, they'd be like... <laughs> and so I'd have a really cool, weird-looking presidency. There'd be fire, there'd be a groove, and a bunch of steroid-out, you know, steroided psycho motherfuckers following me around. And of course, I have access to Air Force One, so I'd load uh, pyro team, band, thugs, and me into the Air Force One, and we'd go west to Southern California, where a lot of bad music resides. And we'd get in the wheel, in the ride, and we'd drive out to Beverly Hills. Driver, pull over to the side. Bodyguards, storm the gate. Pyro team. Band, hit me. Ding, 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 ding. So we got the going up to a mansion groove going. Ding, 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 ding. Bodyguard, knock on the door. <laughs> Oh, Mr. President, oh my God, I can't believe I'm meeting you. Oh my God, it's such an honor, I can't believe. Miss Spears? <laughs> Listen to me very carefully. If I see you within 30 meters of a stage, a microphone, or a recording studio, I'm going to send you and your entire bloodline to Luxembourg for the rest of your life. Miss Pierce, now I'm going to say something to you that millions of people all over the world have wanted to say to you, but their lungs just don't have enough power to carry over the fence to get to your tiny little tin ears. Miss Spears, shut the fuck up. But Mr. President, I love Man, hit me! Ladies and gentlemen, that was the president. And then we'd go back out to the car. We'd go to Yanni's house. We'd break all of his shit. We'd go to John Tesh's house. We'd break all of his shit. And by the time the sun was setting and CNN cameras had caught up to me, I'd be jumping gleefully up and down on Kenny G's saxophone. <laughs> Never again! Never again are you going to sell more CDs than Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, and Charlie Parker put together? Fuck you! Death to false bebop! It'd be fun. Um, I guess I'd be dead by Friday of my administration because I'd be having so much fun. Some non-fun guy would put a bullet in my head and I'd be dead. So life would go back to normal. Uh, Brittany would go back on tour. Kenny would get a new horn and everything would be the same. Woo! Ally McBealian nightmare that we have come to. <laughs> Dread and fear. Okay, let me tell you about this. This thing that happened a few months ago where I, I freaked someone the fuck out. When I'm not doing tours of the band or out here waxing poetic, um, my manager has it in his mind that I'm an actor. And so he alerts the movie agent lady. Okay, he's coming home. Make sure there's 10 scripts waiting for him when he arrives. And if I'm home for four to six weeks, there'll be this pile of movie scripts that I'm supposed to read, be really into, and go off for the humiliating audition. And sometimes the movies are crap. And sometimes they're really cool and you really do want the part. I'm no actor, but I'm crass enough to try and scam into a movie every once in a while. I figure if I get the part, it's, it's their fault. And so anyway, I mean, if they're, if they're crazy enough to give me the part, it's, it's now their problem. And so I'm reading all these scripts and there's this one, uh, it's called Death to Smoochie. Very funny, I'm reading going, this is funny. And there is a part in it of a punch drunk boxer who's lost every bout he's ever fought and now he has the mindset of a, of a five year old. And he says he's over, he's like Ugh! and he's made a lot of money. And he's been co-opted by the mafia and he's got like his own restaurant like champs and basically the mafia uses the restaurant to work a bunch of deals and he hangs out in there and takes photos with visiting senators and whatnot. This boxer has this major love affair, not, you know, like hugging and kissing, but his hero is a child's, like, you know, guy in a dinosaur outfit like Barney. And he watches this show every day. I guess it's Smoochie. And he thinks, like, Smoochie's, you know, the best thing he's ever seen. Smoochie comes into his restaurant one day 
and the boxer loses his shit. I love you, I love you. He's jumping up and down, going nuts. That's the part they're asking me to audition for. So I said, book it. And it's always easy to book it. And then the day of the audition comes, like, what have I done? And your stomach's like, like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'm going to make an ass of myself. I suck. I should have never signed on for this. This is so stupid. But your male macho bullshit will not allow you to call and cancel it. No, I'm a man. I can do it. You think I can't? Fuck you, man. I can do it. So anyway, I'm driving to Warner Brothers gate four with my stomach in and not going, why did I say yes to this? This is so stupid. I'm going to make an ass of myself. I go into the place and Danny DeVito stars and directs the film. I got to do my audition in front of Danny DeVito. I, I figure he's going to be a cool guy. So I'm sitting in the front room of the Warner Brothers, you know, office, and my stomach is in knots, and I'm sitting with all these other actors who, well, I'm sitting with actors, and all their stomachs are in knots, and they're all, we're all holding our scripts like, oh, fuck, is it, they're all kind of nerve-wracking, and this is a big deal film. And so finally this woman comes out, Henry, um, are you ready? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, and I'm walking down the hallway, and I go, how am I going to get through this without making an ass of myself? And I have to totally change my motivation. I know I'm not going to get this part. This movie is way too cool for me to get such a great part. It would be too good a break for me. So knowing I'm not going to get it, I can now rest assured that that won't happen. So instead of trying to get the part, my motivation changes from getting the part to being so over the top, Danny DeVito will never forget me. That's my new motivation. Freak Danny DeVito the fuck out is my new mission. And so I go into the room and there's Danny DeVito and his assistant. Really nice guy. Like, you know, hey Danny, how you doing? Hey Henry, good to meet you. Are you, how do you, what do you think about the movie? I said, it's fucking cool, man. He goes, great. Are, you want to do it? You want to get into this audition? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. And I meet his assistant, this lady, and, and I'm, you know, all pumped up and I shake her hand like 10 times harder than I should. I'm like, hey, good to meet you. Out of just sheer adrenaline, crazoid fear. And she's like, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. She's like, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm getting feeling back in it now. <laughs> and he goes, so you know the scene? I go, yeah. I come in, I, I'm hanging out. I come into the front of the restaurant and Smoochie's there and I go nuts and I read these lines. He goes, right. I'm going to be filming it. So you're going to, you're going to do all your lines to my assistant. I go, okay. And he goes, well, are you ready? I go, sure. And she's sitting at this, you know, at this chair. And so I back up from her. I go, so I just, I can just do it, right? And he's like, anytime you want. I go, so the camera's on, right? He goes, yeah. So I go, okay. And I figure this is it. I yell like, Smoochie, hey! I take a chair in his office and hurl it across the room. <laughs> he and his assistant instinctively duck. A man they've met for 40 seconds has just thrown a chair against a wall. I go running at this woman. She nearly runs out of the room. I bump into a table on my way to her chair. Table falls over. So now we have table over, chair gone. I nearly wipe out a television on his desk. Poor little Danny is running around trying to capture this with digital camera. I make sure to almost back into him all the time. So I'm like, so hey, hey, and there's like, he's like and I, he's like, woo, woo, and this woman's like, and I grab her and I forget the script entirely and I just go, my motivation, be a psycho who's really happy to see this person. And that's all I did. And the scene is like 30 seconds. I stretched it into an excruciating three minutes of worship. And I just made believe I was a five-year-old meeting my super-duper favorite child-time hero. I am shaking this woman like a rag doll. Like, I love you! I love you! I finally put her down. I'm breathing hard, I'm sweating, she's trembling, Danny DeVito's hiding behind the couch. And he comes out, he's like, okay, oh, okay, I go, so, you wanna do it again? And, and they're like, no, no, I mean, I mean uh, no, 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 uh, that, was, that was fine. Uh, so Henry, uh, thanks a lot, thanks a lot for coming in, it was a really, Interesting me meeting you and, and Danny bravely puts his hand out and I'm like right on man Yeah, he's like 
<gasps> and I go up to the lady, God, I hope I didn't shake you up too bad. Are you okay? She's like, no, I'm fine. I'm like, well, good to meet you. And she's like, eh. <laughs> like, all right, well, good luck with your film, knowing I'm never going to see him again. And so I walk down the hallway, back out to where all the trembling actors are sitting on the couch. They look at me, because all I've heard is like yelling and screaming in this room. <laughs> like some man screaming, they've heard furniture fall over. They expect me to come out with Danny DeVito's head. I walk up, hey, break a leg. I did. And I walk out. <laughs> it was cool. So I wend my way back to the hovel, and the phone rings. It's the agent, Henry. Hey, agent lady, what's going on? You did the audition. Uh huh, I just came back from it. It was really cool. Henry. What did you do over there? <laughs> oh, I guess you talked to him, huh? Oh, they called me while you were still in the parking lot. <laughs> well, I don't know. I just kind of went for it. You know, I'm not going to get the part, so I figured I would just be memorable. Well, whatever you did, they loved you, and you're now, like, front runner for the part. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> no, I, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I lost to some other guy, but apparently I was, like, neck and neck with some guy for, like, four weeks. I went in there and made a total jackass out of myself. So I, I've never really tried to understand what the whole uh, acting thing is all about. But anyway, a funky travel story. Um, I am like you. I go out into the world. And being in Europe, being Europeans, which I know many of you are, some of you are from other places, you are in a very beautiful part of the world for travel. You can go a little bit south, bam, you're in Spain, very cool. Bam, you're in Italy, very warm, very cool, very good food. Or you can go a little bit of south of that, and you're in Africa. You have Africa like eight hours away from you. From here, it's like four and a half hours. Hello, you're in Casablanca. How fucking cool is that? If I was living here, I wouldn't live here. I'd be always going into some funky place. In America, you fly five hours, you're in America. You fly four hours that way, yellow, you're still in America. And you fly this way, you're, oh, you're in the South of America, they can't count. And they have hoods on them, it don't, don't go. And so well, you guys, you fly five hours and no one's speaking your language. How cool is that? And so I try and go all these places I've never been to eradicate myself of the inherent bullshit that I have. And last year, I had four days off between a show in Spain and a show in Portugal. And the show in Portugal, I knew was going to be my last day on earth. Why? Because we were opening for Iron Maiden. Okay? Right. Iron Maiden is a legion of fans like these gentlemen over here. Okay? If you are in front of 18 to 20,000 Iron Maiden fans, the upside is they only want to see one band. The downside is you are not in that band. You are the irritant. They hate your guts. They have it in their minds, what little minds they have. <laughs> the, the, the little tiny minds, little like... See, shake your head. I want to hear it. I want to hear it knock around inside the cranium. But anyway, only kidding, only kidding. But you know how you guys are. You want Maiden. And when the opening band is on, fucking wankers, Maiden. Believe me, I've been there. I've done it. I survived it. You know, my back still hurts. And anyway, so you have these people, Maiden, Maiden, Maiden. And you're like, well, uh, we're not Iron Maiden, but boy, we sure can play a tune. Ooh, you don't like us. And they have it in their mind that if you weren't on stage, Iron Maiden would be. That if you weren't playing from 8.05 to 8.45, Iron Maiden would have been there at 8 o'clock. So they figure if you weren't there, you, you know, basically you're just blocking them from Maiden. And... Picture the, the mindset of an Iron Maiden fan at an Iron Maiden gig. They've been waiting for this gig for weeks. They've been looking at the ticket every day to make sure the ink does not fall off the piece of paper. They keep reading it every day. Still says Iron Maiden. Okay, cool, cool. Does not say Bjorn again. It says Iron Maiden. We are going to see fucking Maiden. And they play every Maiden record over and over, every Iron Maiden bootleg. They're wearing the shirts. They are psyched. And there's some opening band. We're not Iron Maiden. Hey! Maiden, Maiden. If you've ever seen interviews with Iron Maiden, your hero, pal, Bruce Dickinson, that, oh yeah, he's a mental fucking colossus, isn't he? He's just fantastic. Yeah, right, man. We write, uh, we write songs about books we've read, right? I mean, we're not stupid, man. We don't write songs about like cars and girls and whatnot. We write songs about real things like books. 
like a, a song we wrote called Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, right? Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. Hey, you know, it's about a bloke with an albatross around his neck sailing about. So we wrote the song about a bloke on a boat with a bird around his neck going, I'm so alone, right? Because sometimes you're walking about with a bird around your neck, or it feels like a bird around your neck. And you go, hey, man, I'm so alone, right? So we wrote that song for you, right? Because we're always thinking, right? We wrote this song called Flight of Icarus. It's about, it's a fable. It's a fable. It's about this bloke named Icarus, right? And one day he goes, hello, I think I'm going to fly about. So he builds, he builds some wings out of wax and feathers, right? And he goes flying about like a cunt through the air, right? And he goes up to this rumored ball of fire called the sun that hides obscured by the clouds over the UK, right? So he goes up to the rumored ball of fire and the wings melt because they're made out of wax, right? So he goes plummeting, plummeting down to the earth and he fucking dies, right? All right, so we wrote this song called Flood of Icarus, right? And it's basically saying, hey man, wake up. Don't go flying about near the sun unless you're in an airplane, right? Because the wings, the wings are metal, right? And they won't melt, right? So here's a song that's working on two different levels, two different levels at once, right? No, no, check it out, check it out. Because the wings of the plane are made out of metal, right? And we play metal music, right? Right? So the song is coming at you here as well as here, right? So the song is basically doing like... Right? Two-dimensional, right? See? So Maiden's always thinking always thinking and so when you're when you're in front of like 18,000 people who want two and a half hours of that they're gonna kill you because they have radar and they can pick up the wise ass in any band kill Henry kill Henry kill Henry rip him limb from limb and so I know I'm gonna die <laughs> so I know I have four slim days left in the world. And so I figure, well, if I'm in Spain, I have four days left. I'm not going to go to Portugal all that quickly since I'm going to die. So I'm going to go somewhere else. It's been the last four days of my life in a place I've never been to. So I look at the map and what's right below Spain. Hello, North Africa. So I go down to Tunisia. So when I go to the town of Tunis, so I can have my little experience and have my night in Tunisia, like the Dizzy Gillespie tune, right? Night in Tunisia is the song. It's a vacation here, here, right, right, yeah, okay? And so I get on a cheap flight. I go down to Tunis, and I get out of the plane with my duffel bag. I get a handful of Tunisian money, and I get in this cab, and I go about five minutes. And the guy goes, okay, my friend, the cab ride will cost you this. And it's like 50 pounds. I went, mm, no. He went, what do you mean, no? I said, no, you think I'm a tourist, and you're trying to rip me off. Ah, from that, I guess you want to haggle. I indeed do, sir. <laughs> and our eyebrows started to knit. And he goes, okay, I will charge you 10% less. Fuck you, I'll give you it for like four whatevers. Ah, you are a very good haggler, my friend. I love your kung fu haggling style. Do you know the confused tourist? <laughs> do you know the angry, the angry cab driver? And so we haggled for a good four minutes, very high volume, total smiles. It was really fun. You are a very good haggler, my friend. I love your haggling style. Please come and haggle in my cab any time. And so we shook on it, and I gave him the right amount of money. And I left the cab in my Tunisian vacation adventure right before death by the hands of Iron Maiden fans had begun. When you go play in front of Iron Maiden, they're very devoted. There were two guys who had four bed sheets sewn together. One pole here, one pole here. They're like 50 feet apart, waving this long string of sewn together bed sheets uh, with lots of uh, you know, magic marker ink that said Iron Maiden, and all crooked. Spelled correctly though, very proud of that. And well, you know, all the multiple syllables, you know, it's crazy getting them all together and stuff. Ask George W, it's, it's a struggle. And so then they kind of ran out of, of inspiration or, or artistic skill or supplies because then they tried to draw a picture of Eddie. Eddie the monster who lives on the front of all their different album covers. And they basically ran out of, of brightly colored ink so they had to resort to mascara, lipstick, dirt, uh, mud, wh whatever. And th what they end up with is like an angry looking oatmeal and raisin cookie with a claw hand. <laughs> It looked like a, a chubby hamster on steroids. Like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. 
And I, 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 was, I was fucking with these guys in front of like 18,000 people. I go like, what's that? Is that a pissed off oatmeal cookie? <laughs> Ooh, made it, made it, made it. And they got really, really super duper mad. But anyway, I got out of the, ho- the, uh, the cab in, in Tunis and I go into my, my hotel. I get my room, which is a tiny box that smells of North African bug spray, kind of exotic pretty intense and so I leave my duffel bag behind and I go back into the white hot streets of one in the morning Tunis and it's blazing hot the, the, the Sahara Desert is like right there and so it's like super hot and so I go walking down the streets which are packed with people because it's too hot to hang out in your place and I go into this like n- really scary diner restaurant bar thing and there's a man behind glass by the front and he's making crepes I go, so you're making crepes, my friend. He goes, what does it look like I'm doing, my stupid friend? I went, okay, so uh, give me a crepe. What do you want in your crepe? Uh, what's the brown gray stuff in the back? I think it is dog. All right, so give me a dog crepe. What do you have to drink? Lukewarm Coca-Cola in small blue-green glass bottles. I'll take it. So I, I got a dog omelet and a warm Coke. I paid him my money, and I go staring back out into the streets of White Hot Tunis, and I sit on the front steps of a pension that are just, like, soaked in dried bum piss. So I'm, I'm hanging out in this, like, intense ammonia with my, with my rapidly cooling dog and my rapidly warming Coke. But to me... This is adventure, because I'm not in Ohio, I'm in North Africa, in Tunis, alone with a dog omelet and a Coke. To me, this is really cool. And so I'm like, cool. Dun, 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 dun. And this huge man walks up to me. Parlez-vous? He starts speaking French. I go, hello, sir, hold on a minute. I'm sorry, I am very limited in my vocal capacity. I only speak English. Ah, I speak English, too. I speak 18 different languages. Well, that's very nice. May I sit down next to you? Yeah, sure. Sit down. Mmm, so you like sports, eh? Very strange way to open a conversation. <laughs> I have an inkling as to where the conversation is going, but I'm not going to be judgmental. So I go, uh, do I like sports? No. Oh, then feel my arm! Here we go. <laughs> Ooh, my goodness, your arm is so hard. Oh, how do you do that? Mm, yes, it is. So you have hotel room here in Tunis? No, actually, I'm sleeping in a cardboard box by the bus station. Aren't I funny? <laughs> huh. Yes, I have a hotel room. Huh. How about you and me go up to your hotel room, huh? Nope. Huh. Do you want a drink? Already got one. Huh. Do you want to go swimming with me tomorrow? <laughs> no. Uh, The guy will not take no for an answer. He's like a typical guy. Do you want to wrestle? (laughs) And I said, no. Now, I wasn't just blowing him off, okay? I had a definite opinion about this. Here's something you do not know about me. I have had experience in the world of wrestling. About 1850, I was in high school. And I went to an all-boys prep school where everyone called you by your last name, the teachers, the other students. Everyone was kind of a dick. And you know how mean boys can be to boys. And so, like, you suck. You're never going to be anything. And the teachers who we had to call instructors were like, you suck. You're never going to be anything. And I'm high on Ritalin my mother's giving me. So I'm on anti-spastica drugs. That's the French. Uh, So I am a spasmodique. And I'm taking Ritalin so I don't go, "Ah, ah, ah," And Ritalin just has me going, and it, it doesn't make you have much of an appetite. So I weigh like, like 80 pounds, and I look like I have early signs of Tourette's. So then I'm like, I suck, I'll never be anything. Because I totally believe what everyone told me. And so one day, I'm, I'm twitching down the hall, and this teacher walks up and says, Henry, like, who called me by my first name? Henry, you have the eye of the tiger. I'm like, I've never seen a tiger with eyes like mine. He goes, Henry, you have the eye of the tiger. I'd like to see you come out this summer for wrestling camp. I'm like, me? Be a wrestler? Henry, you can do it. And here's a teacher who's being nice to me. He's calling me by my first name. He tells me I have the eye of the tiger. This is bitching. I said, sir, 
I'll be there. And months go by, summer hits Washington, D.C. like a hammer. It's so hot and oppressive in that town. And so there I am going on a public bus two hours back out to the school that I hate. And so there I am going across the campus from hell into the gymnasium, which is now the hot box from hell. And usually during the school year, I am punched out, stomped on, and thrown around the gymnasium by guys who will later become Chicago Bears, Washington Redskins, and Miami Dolphins. But in this time, they're just like, hey, what? What's up, you little fag? Ding, 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 ding. And so I'm going back into the barn of, you know, humiliation voluntarily. And there I am, and there's the coach, the nice teacher guy who called me, Henry, and said, I have the eye of the tiger, and a bunch of men standing around in wrestling outfits. And so I go, hey, coach, it's me, Henry, the guy with the eye of the tiger. You're late, you little pussy. Go in the locker and put your fucking gear on, woman. Okay. I'm all intimidated. I go into locker, the locker room. I go to locker 53. I open locker 53. Inside is my gear. A leather and canvas helmet with a strap, which I put on. A tank top with the armholes come down to my waist. A pair of hot pants and a pair of tights. They kind of billow off me. I look like Wonder Woman without the tits. And I come out into the gym, which is covered with canvas mats with yellow circles on them. I'm like, here I am. Come here! Okay. Get on the mat! And I just get on the mat. Hey, you, come here! Get on him! And this guy gets on me, puts his arm around my waist and his hand on my arm. It's like position one. He's almost mounting me. It's, it's kind of like a, a, an abrupt sex ed class. And, I'm like, I like, and I looked up, I go, so now what do I do? And he just blows the whistle, which means the beginning of round one. We are wrestling. Well, he is wrestling. I am getting tied into a knot of human pain that is so intense, it hurts just thinking about it. In about one and a half seconds, everything on me is like bow-tied, half nelson I am just so thoroughly tangled up. He's like tying my fingers in knots. The only thing that didn't hurt were my fingernails, my toenails, and my hair. Everything else is like, ah! And the guy has so pinned me, I am in so much pain. And I feel like pressure on my face. Something is on my face. Like, okay, what, what could it be? And I start kind of wiggling my face back and forth, trying to use my nose and my cheeks as some kind of detector as to what part of this boy's physiology is weighing down upon me. I feel what feels like an anus Squishing down on my cheekbone. Aha, uh -huh. those would be butt cheeks on either side of cheekbone. I feel testicles in my eye sockets. <laughs> and that would be probably a penis going across my forehead. This boy is sitting on my face. And there's nowhere for me to go. And at first, there was a feeling of, of repulsion, extreme dismay. And I'm like, <laughs> But soon, those feelings gave way to just a feeling of, of calm and, and safety. I felt so safe and warm underneath this boy's canvas crotch, S slowly becoming moist, young boy funk permeating the canvas wrestling outfit. I'm like, oh. So that's what a ball sack and asshole smells like. Huh. And so, at this time, I had a revelation, an epiphany, if you will. I realized in my still foreign mind that wrestling was not for me. <laughs> and so clear was this thought in my still forming mind, to have a revelation of this kind of power was startling to say the least. And so I wanted to share this revelation with the coach and with anyone who would listen so I needed to get out of this very unenviable position. So I, I discovered that I had an index finger loose that was not tied down and tended to that. And I tapped some part of my overworthy opponent's body. Excuse me, sir? Yeah, I, I'm the guy. I'm, I'm underneath your vault. Um, I would wonder if you'd be so kind as to let me off, because I, I down here underneath your vault, I, I had a revelation, and I'd like to share it with the world, if I may. If you'd be so kind as to let me off. My opponent uh, was very merciful, 
knowing without a doubt in his young and still forming mind that he had beaten me and there's no way I was ever going to get out of this position of excruciating pain. So he very mercifully let me up and I managed to get the bald dick and asshole print off my face and before I had to face down the other wrestlers and the wrestling coach. And I straightened my nose out and I went up to the coach. I said, sir, he went, get back down there for round two, you pussy. I said, sir, there will be no round two. I said, get down there, sir, hold your wind. Sir, down there underneath that boy's crotch, I had a revelation. I had an epiphany, if you will, where I realized without a doubt in my mind that wrestling is not for me. You little pussy, sir! I'm going to go back into the locker room right now, go back to locker 53, divest myself of leather and canvas helmet, tank top, hot pants and tights, put my street clothes back on, go across the campus back to the public bus stop, get on the two-hour excruciating public bus ride back to white-hot, oppressive, bullet-ridden, racially intense Washington, D.C., go back to my mother's microscopic apartment and sit at her kitchen table for a seemingly endless period of 25 months and wait for the Ramones to happen, <laughs> which I did. Thanks, everybody. See you. Good night. I'm up for it. I'm up for it. I'm up for it. I'm up for it.